pictures and depiction, recognition and political cartoons of Putin, from a strategic mastermind to the object of contempt and mockery, Arkash Copper, Global Studies Quarterly, Volume 4, Issue 3, July, 2024, published, 04 July, 2024, Article History, Abstract. This article contributes to discussions over the role of recognition in international relations by focusing on an aspect of popular culture, specifically political cartoons. It argues that studying political cartoons may contribute to capturing aspects of recognition that go beyond those rooted in formal interactions between states, and thereby enhance our understanding of what Ringmer called the recognition game. The article focuses on political cartoons about Russia Putin in two periods. The first is after the annexation of Crimea, while the second is after the outbreak of the war in Ukraine. The tones of caricatures in these two periods differ radically. Images in the first depict a transgressive Putin to be feared, while not necessarily a flattering image. The article argues that this set of images can be interpreted as a form of recognition of Russia, being a great power to be reckoned with, and could encourage Russia's reckless moves later. Once we get to the second period, however, there is a rupture. The tone of depiction changes, showing a pathetic, deplorable Putin. These images do not simply convey misrecognition, but convey humiliation, a difference somewhat overlooked by the discipline. The aura of power remained, and cartoons even suggested that Putin was a skilled strategist, a skilled player of international chess, even if he did not play according to the accepted rules of the game. Arguably, they conveyed a form of appraisal and recognition. With the invasion of Ukraine, however, cartoons changed radically. Just a few days after the aggression cartoons of Putin became extremely unfavorable, showing him as a deplorable figure to be ridiculed. The aim of this paper is to contribute to studies on recognition, focusing on how popular culture, including memes, cartoons, and caricatures, offers an additional layer to recognition, which may convey an approving image of the self, at times not in line or even contradicting more formal forms of recognition. Thus, the paper posits that a study of recognition should go beyond the study of formal, institutionalized relations between states because in today's world, recognition is increasingly multi-layered. Its study should also include representations of the other in popular culture and unofficial settings. By visiting political cartoons of Putin stroke Russia, the paper explores what political cartoons add to what Ringma called the recognition game. Ringma 2002, and suggests that cartoons, but also memes, films, and other products of popular culture, by expressing appreciation, condemnation, and ridicule, offer visual representations of a state's standing and status. In making this claim, the assertion is that recognition is not exclusively an elite game of how heads of states treat and regard one another, or what standing states enjoy in international institutions. Concurrently, since modern nations create an identity between states and their citizens, how the people think citizens of other states regard them and their state, forever 2020, is also significant. This can become especially important in places where people believe that their state has not been treated properly and has been the victim of other powers. Beatty 2017, 23. One way through which judgments of others reach citizens is popular culture, for example, political cartoons. Evidence shows that this is indeed the case in Russia, with citizens following how their state is represented internationally. For example, a short video about Putin made in Norway in 2015 after the annexation of Crimea had over 900,000 views in the post-Soviet space, 76% from Russia, and led to a lively online discussion, Capon 2015, attesting to the fact that images in the Western media about how their country is depicted do reach Russians, one, experiences of the past years have demonstrated that wars are fought not only on the battlefield, but also via cartoons, videos, and images. Simotyuk 2023, these examples justify taking images seriously, as they are not merely captivating and insightful illustrations with no impact. As the historian Alex Danchev argued, contrary to popular belief, it is given to artists, not politicians, to create a new world order. Cowling 2016, this conviction increasingly resonates in our studies, 
with the discipline expanding its attention toward visuals, including political cartoons. Hansen 2017, Films Shapiro 2009, and social media Duncan 2020. This expansion has been accompanied by works scrutinizing suitable methodologies for analyzing such works of expression. Bleecker 2015, Hansen 2017, as I will discuss later. This article will discuss six cartoons drawn by three award-winning cartoonists, whose works are widely circulated and shared online two cartoons by each two depicting Putin stroke Russia in two time periods. The first period is after the annexation of Crimea, while the second is after Russia's war in Ukraine began. The cartoons chosen are only examples because many similar cartoons can be found. These particular six were chosen, nevertheless, with the explicit intention of selecting pairs of cartoons by the same cartoonists to reveal the rupture and the contrast in the way they depict Putin in the two time periods. Morris highlighted the merit of focusing on the work of a specific cartoonist over a longer period of time because a series of cartoons on a topic may reveal a story in messages which the cartoonist gradually develops. Morris 1991 Changes in depiction frequently reflect not only shifts in personal attitude, but general movements in public sentiments. Dues 2001 995 Russia's reckless invasion of Ukraine despite warnings here and there, took many by surprise. It was a surprise both for the actions Russia took, but equally so for Russia's miscalculation of the West's response, and Russia's seeming lack of any backup plan, should the invasion not led to a quick regime change in Ukraine. By looking at political cartoons created after the 2014 annexation of Crimea, the paper will suggest that this miscalculation was perhaps not so surprising, as these images, despite their criticism of Putin, reflect an image of Russia's strength and the West's impotence, which could encourage Putin. In the post-COVID world, when normal state-level interactions were limited, representations by popular culture could have gained greater significance. Putting it differently, if the annexation of Crimea led to a recognition of Russia's willpower and strength, which the cartoons clearly confirmed, then, as Putin could have calculated, a more forceful revealing of Russia's power should have further bolstered Russia's image as a great power. The exact opposite happened, and cartoons created after the invasion capture this very vividly. There is a radical rupture as the tone of cartoons changes after the invasion of Ukraine. Those cartoons drawn after the outbreak of the war no longer portray Putin as a strategic mastermind, but instead as a deplorable, pathetic figure, depicting him in highly contemptuous and even humiliating ways. The last part of the article will focus on these images and reflect on the role of humiliation. Although humiliation may be regarded as the opposite of recognition, Margulis argues this is not the case. Humiliation is an emotion extremely difficult to overcome. The difference between dwelling on humiliation and not on recognition is not the same sort of difference as that between seeing a cup half empty and seeing it half full. The difference, I believe, cuts deeper. Margulat 2002, 112. Thus, even though lack of appreciation of status can be captured by a variety of concepts, such as status deficit, status anxiety, status inconsistency, status dissatisfaction, misrecognition, and status uncertainty or status humiliation. See Roran 2023, pages 12 to 3. Humiliation cuts particularly deep and creates a scar that is easily torn open because it is not only about lack of status, but an explicit expression of reduction of the other's position, and thus is the harshest form of non-recognition. The second section of the paper will briefly discuss the question of who grants recognition, and on what basis, highlighting its numerous layers. The third section will discuss what makes political cartoons intriguing, and will offer guideposts on how to study them, highlighting aesthetics, contextuality, temporality, and cartoons' ability to create stroke reinforce stroke question identities. Following this, the fourth section of the article will focus on Russia's ambivalent quest for recognition, which partly explains why its quest for recognition tends to end in frustration, which will offer the background to see, as will be discussed in the fifth section, why the image projected by the first set of images may resonate with Russia's understanding of what makes a state a great power. Finally, 
The second part of the fifth section of the article will discuss cartoons after the outbreak of the war, and briefly reflect on humiliation, and why it differs from misrecognition, recognition, by whom, for what. Constructivist-inspired approaches to international relations focus their analysis on identity, Ringma 2002, 120, and tend to put the question of recognition into the limelight of their studies, although its formal manifestations, like a seat in the UN or in the Security Council, are tangible. Recognition is an inherently elusive concept that is hardly measurable and is tainted by subjectivism. It operates like a mirror through which the actor has their image reflected. If the reflection fits the actor's desired vision of itself, Cassini 2022, it enhances its sense of ontological security by confirming it, while ruptures and the lack of recognition can create dissonance and can thereby be detrimental to the actor's identity and security. Nirosna 2022, 78. Furthermore, recognition is not to be accomplished and achieved, but maintained, requiring the permanent management of status, which feeds into states into subjective identity formation, where actors need their identity to be constantly affirmed and reaffirmed. Birenskota 2010, 3601, Cassini 2022. Although recognition is essential for every state because mutual recognition is the basis of sovereign relations, it is of a different dimension for states that regard themselves as great powers. In tracing the origins of recognition between great powers, the Congress of Vienna offers an ideal starting point. Given the role it played in the formation of modern diplomatic practices, this does not mean that status and precedence would have played no role before, quite the contrary but the basis has shifted from the holy to the mundane. Following the Napoleonic Wars, the great powers gathered during the Congress to resolve matters of international order, along with less significant states of Europe. The great powers sought to manage the affairs of the continent for the following century. Gradually, international society expanded to include not only Europe's core states but also other powers like Russia, the Ottoman Empire, and Japan, with recognition conferred by fellow imperial powers. Being recognized required the attainment of certain civilizational standards. Yet this was hardly enough as Okura Tenshin ironically observed. In the days when Japan was engaging in peaceful arts, the Westerners used to think of it as an uncivilized country. Since Japan started massacring thousands of people in the battlefields of Manchuria, the Westerners have called it a civilized country, quoted in Suzuki 2005, 137. Thus, Recognition as a great power also required the possession of material resources and capabilities, which the Japanese demonstrated, for example, by defeating the Russians in 1905. In his study on Poland's and Russia's quest for recognition by Europe's great powers, Neumann showed that the two were both indispensable. Neither military might nor being fully part of Christian Europe would suffice Neumann 2014. In the account of the English school, it is the role of great powers to maintain order, which is a duty that comes with special rights. Bull 1977, 196, 202, this conceptualization implies a normative expectation on great powers, which, as Bull admitted, is frequently not fulfilled. Although great powers could be the anchors of international society, they could also be the source of disorder and world-shaking conflict. Still, when members of the club can work together, that is, when the balance of power is maintained, global order is preserved. Still, the fact that recognition is tied to both ideational and material factors, combining formal and informal elements creates a hotbed for hypocrisy, and a permanent basis opportunity for disappointment and frustration for states that feel their interests were disregarded. This feeling was justified at times, for example, Japan after the end of World War I, three or Russia at times following the end of the Cold War. Beatty 2017, 21. Still, despite the existence of some objective indicators, recognition is largely a subjective notion, like when it depends on states' perception of being convinced of having attained it, or the feeling of frustration for being misrecognized, which can turn them aggressive and even led to wars. Lindemann 2012, 210. Who confers recognition? Does it always matter? First, there are times when it is not possible to talk about one international society in which states would seek recognition. 
When the McCartney mission visited China in the early 18th century, the Chinese Empire could not care less about being recognized by European power. European powers were not significant others for China to consider. Also, international society can be deeply divided. Thus, when Gaulle argues that Nazi Germany or Napoleonic France, despite being military powers of the first rank was not enough to make others recognize it as a proper great power, Bull 1977, 196, he refers to times when the nature of international society itself was contested, for Germany, its allies offered an alternative reference group, and Napoleon created its satellite states, in a divided international society. When some states seek to challenge the premises of existing order, recognition by some could imply non-recognition by others. Furthermore, non-recognition and being regarded as a bad guy could confirm a particular status of being a revolutionary Duncombe 2019, 157. Also, states with revolutionary exceptionalism may be driven much less by seeking recognition than by the aim to realize their mission. Such missionary zeal is accompanied by a vision of how international society and states should look like, of which the United States, revolutionary France, and the USSR are examples, Holstey 2011. Furthermore, recognition is not one-dimensional, as the international world consists of numerous clubs of organizations, that is, groups and cliques through which recognition is conferred on states. Rorun 2023, 17. This ranges from formal institutions like the UN to the Club of Nuclear Powers, private interaction of leaders, to the general perception how a state is seen in official and public interactions. What confers prestige in one club may turn into a stigma in another. Rorun 2023, 20. Thus, for example, following the annexation of Crimea, Russia's status in formal terms was in decline as Russia was excluded from the G8, and sanctions were imposed on the country, France 24 2014. However, at the same time, as Roran highlights, the same reckless move resonated very differently for some parts of the US public. Russia's annexation of Crimea drastically shifted the US public discourse, instead of being seen as a second tier, fallen superpower, it was seen as a revived empire. Russia became a state willing to shun norms of the liberal international order to resurrect the Russian and Soviet empires. In Roran 10, this increase of prestige for Russia was also widespread among leaders subscribing to a liberal values, and those who saw in Putin's action exemplary decisiveness and powerful leadership. Keating and Kaksmaska 2019, among populist leaders meeting, Putin became a symbol of appreciating Russia's strong arm leadership style. Wajna 2022, 417, 429. Furthermore, recognition is not independent of state society relations, except for states in almost complete autarky, such as North Korea. During the imperial era, vertical recognition of one's subordinates could be relatively ignored, but by the Cold War, these started to matter. Even if the only significant other for the USSR was the United States, Ringma 2002, 129, the millions of dissidents fleeing the Eastern Bloc, and gradually the difference in the economic performance still undermined the legitimacy of the Brotherhood of Socialist States around the USSR, which was reflected in the way the USSR was perceived. The USSR and the United States might have been taken as equals at the negotiating table, but their prestige and standing were increasingly worlds apart. That is to say, even if the USSR could act relatively freely in its socialist sphere of influence, all its actions reflected on it and weakened its standing, becoming sources of disappointment and inferiority for not being adequately recognized. Studying political cartoons. The power of political cartoons has been noted already a long time ago, although their systematic analysis only started recently. In 1941, Bader, for example, was writing about cartoons as China's new weapon in China's fight against the Japanese. Bader 1941, in the past decades, international relations scholars have been paying increasing attention to the role of cartoons, highlighting how political cartoons reflect critically on political issues and challenge political imaginaries. For political cartoons are intriguing, they must be in a sense simple, and almost trivial for their audiences to get their meaning immediately. At the same time, 
they must not only make their object ridiculous, but they must do it in a witty way, adding an element of surprise and style. Without these, an image may offer a disagreeable representation of its object, but would hardly count as a good caricature. In other words, political caricatures are both simple and extremely complex at the same time. Building on the literature on studying visuals in general and cartoons in particular, I will highlight four points to assist and guide their analysis. First, we must consider their aesthetics. Bleeker, in his seminal work on visuals, highlighted that art goes beyond creating lifelike representations with perfect resemblance between signifier and signified, Bleeker 2009, 21. This creates, however, not misrepresentation, but a way to grasp reality differently, creating aesthetic insights that go beyond normal understanding. For example, by capturing emotional aspects of life and conflict that are difficult to put into words. Bleeker 2009, this aspect of images resonates with what we discussed above as the quality of caricatures, where ruptures or incongruities are essential to create the humorous effect. Like the heads of states paradoxically put on shows heads of animals in one of the caricatures below. The second aspect of images is their link to other cultural references. An image never stands alone, Callahan 2020, 38, it is always in the web of the intertextual, Hansen 2011, and the intervisual, Callahan 2020, references that along with the context in which the observer looks at them, given the observer's dispositions, culture, personal background, time, and place of being confronted with the image, creates a meaning in the eyes of the beholder. Thus, images have no authoritative meaning, and they are always encompassed by a touch of ambiguity. Still, it is reasonable to assume that it is possible to unpack how they intervene, and what general meaning they carry in a particular socio-political setting from a particular type of viewer's position. The third aspect to focus on is temporality and change. Although many political cartoons contain only one image, some are short comic strips that allow for dynamism and change. Chen et al. 2017, 126. A good example is Marian Kamensky's cartoon, depicting Putin in two time periods identified by yesterday and today. In the first cartoon, Putin is a strong man riding a big horse, while in the second, he is riding a pink toy unicorn in rainbow colors. Point five. Although the second image itself would be demeaning, in contrast with the earlier one, it also highlights the fall, making the present even more embarrassing. This temporal aspect is grasped in this study by taking two cartoons from the same cartoonists, from two different time periods. Finally, the fourth point in studying political cartoons focuses on how they depict self-stroke other relations. Popular culture, including political cartoons, contains effective means of boundary formation that contributes to the reinforcing of identities. Ditma 2005, when focusing on recognition and rejection, this aspect of cartoons directly comes to the fore, expressing the relations between Putin, Russia and the West. One characteristic of political cartoons that the analysis must keep in mind, though, is that political cartoons ridicule all characters, and everyone in a caricature is depicted in a distorted, funny way. This is the nature of caricatures. Still, actors are not equal, and political caricatures clearly indicate the relations between them, with some in more inferior positions. Russia's paradoxical quest for recognition, becoming a member while feeling superior, seeking recognition of the West, has been at the core of Russia's foreign relations for centuries. Neumann and Pauli at 2011, 106. The desired status, however, has never been fully attained, even though since the time of Peter the Great, Russia was moving closer to European international society. It remained a peripheral player, with Western powers not granting it the equal status it craved. International relations scholars pointed out, compared to proper European nations, Russia would always come up short Reimer 2002, 115, Russia was a classic case of Western misrecognition. Nirosna 2022, 87. Russia experienced trouble with maintaining its great power credentials throughout what Eric Hobsbawm calls the long 19th century Neumann 2008 b. 138. Also, Russia was a peripheral player that is integrated into the Western hegemonic discourse, 
albeit on terms that it may deem unequal and unfair. Kanji and Kazharsky 2023, 562. This lack of recognition, however, has two sides. On the one hand, this is about Russia not receiving the status and recognition it craved. On the other hand, Russia's quest for recognition was always tainted by emphasizing Russia's exceptionalism and difference. Thus, this quest was always a quest seeking recognition in the liminal position of the stranger, where Russia wanted to be regarded as a member of the club, but at the same time demanded others recognize that it would not wear the standard tie demanded of all members. Arguing that Russia lacked proper recognition is not simply an observation by IR international relations, analysts, because it is often suggested that this lack of recognition had far-reaching implications in triggering those Russian policies that had decisive consequences for global order. Ringmer argues that the biggest mistake that France and England committed in the summer of 1939, however, was not to recognize the Soviet Union as a great power. Ringmer 2002, 127. A similar argument claims that it was non-recognition of Russia, and its interests that made Russia's conflict with Ukraine possible, even inevitable to Zahankov 2015, 280. Regardless of whether this lack of recognition originated in the West's shortcomings in making gestures, in Russia's oversensitivity, or in both, these factors played a role. Experts seem to agree on the fact that problems concerning Russia's recognition have undermined Russia's willingness to cooperate with the West, and even turned the country to regard the West as its enemy. Thus, seeking recognition has come to the fore in various forms throughout Russia's history, and led to a perpetual anxiety and frustration. Kanji and Kazharsky 2023, 580. Initially, it was about becoming a great imperial power on the model of England and France. Next, following the revolution of 1917, the Soviet Union turned into a pariah, which had to seek recognition as a member of international society, which in formal terms to some extent was realized with the Soviet Union joining the League of Nations in 1934. Following the Second World War, seeking recognition again became of paramount importance, particularly recognition as a power equal to the United States. Although numerous states under Soviet control and influence showed full support and recognition for the USSR, the only actor of equal weight that the USSR looked for recognition was the United States. Rima 2002, 129. Finally, following the Cold War, the question of standing and recognition came to the fore again. Underlying Russia's quest for recognition is a paradox. Although Russia has been seeking recognition, it has been seeking to have both its membership in Western international society, but also its uniqueness, making it different from other members recognized. This resonates with Russia's self-image, in which it is both Western and at the same time non-Western. Russia's position at the top of a hierarchy in a civilizational area distinct from both West and East. Scanian 2018, 39, a difference that came to the fore at the time of Peter the Great, equally so during the communist times, and again today with references to Eastern Orthodoxy. 6. While the tension between being part of the group and preserving one's unique identity is an inherent one for all processes of identity formation, arguably this tension is extremely acute for Russia and is one of the root causes of problems in Russia's quest for recognition. 7. The Soviet Union's quest for recognition demonstrates this perfectly. Right after the revolution, the Soviet Union wanted nothing to do with Western powers as it was believed a global revolution which would sweep away decadent Western capitalist powers, Orkula 2008, 45, was coming. Yet, as the global revolution did not follow, the USSR needed to normalize its relations with other states and had to become a member of international society. This was necessarily an ambivalent act as states of the international society. Subscribed to an ideology that was based on the exact juxtaposition of Soviet identity, against which the identity of the Soviet regime was built. Thus, returning to the club metaphor, the USSR wanted to join a club of which had a founding charter. It fundamentally disagreed with. This tension did not really fade away with the end of the Cold War. It was not the USSR anymore, but Russia, with all the characteristics, sensibilities, and frustrations captured by post-colonial studies, with otherness and a sense of inequality and difference shaping Russian identity and discourses, 
more resolved 2013, 19, when Russia turned toward the West again, seeking its recognition as a great power, its quest was tainted by resentment toward Western paternalism, and a sense of superiority rooted in Russia's uniqueness. Thus, Russia's re-joining of the West was packed with tension and ambivalence. Eight, this was reflected in the fact that Russia, which gradually meant Putin, despite emphasizing partnership with the West and claiming to subscribe to its values, never missed an opportunity to make critical remarks on Western hypocrisy. More is of 2013, 22. Point nine, the point here is not whether these criticisms were true or not. Clearly the West deserves a fair share of criticism, but that through these criticisms Russia always questioned the validity and authenticity of norms on the basis of which the West was to offer recognition. In other words, by pointing out that others were cheating in the recognition game, Russia questioned whether these values could truly be the relevant yardstick by which to measure Russia's standing. This also implied that there had to be other measurements for deciding whether Russia was worthy of membership in the club. This reluctance was also reflected in the fact that, even though Russia entered numerous international institutions, it did so in an ambiguous manner. It was a member, but it did not always take part in meetings, G8, or was reluctant to follow the norms prescribed. More is of 2013, 20. Thus, Russia sought recognition but on bases that were not of Western values, but values that were unique to Russia. At the same time, for a long time, these critical words were somewhat empty as Russia could not present a meaningful alternative more as of 2013, 22. Marxism and communism offered this alternative for the USSR, but the Cold War discredited these, and Russia had little to offer. The problem was not simply the question of recognition, but uncertainty concerning Russia's identity, as Mirosna succinctly summarized, by declaring Russia's situatedness in both Europe and Asia. The ruling elites found themselves caught in a bind that made it difficult to articulate an unambiguous vision of identity, pursue consistent foreign policy, and gain recognition of the great power self-image. Mirosna 2022, 89. Under such conditions, seeking to have one's desired image reflected in the mirror was inherently a frustrating exercise, as it had been unclear what the appealing vision of the self the external world reflected should be. Perhaps these were the times when the West missed the opportunity to make gestures to Russia, and recognize it not for what it was already, but for what it could have become. Ten instead, one slap in the face followed another, no new Marshall plan but instead NATO expansion and a military campaign against Russia's ally Serbia. Nirozna 2022, 89. Gradually, however, Russia found a suitable ideological basis to offer an alternative by emphasizing traditional family values, religion, and homophobia. These were values that resonated well for numerous right-wing and conservative political actors in the West. These were further supplemented by proclaiming Russia as the leader of the Eastern Orthodox world, Malksu 2022, demanding a special place for Russia, that is, seeking recognition, but with a difference. This sense of uniqueness is accompanied by a sense of exceptionalism, where uniqueness refers to difference and exceptionalism to superiority. Russia regards itself as the successor of the USSR, a superpower, adding one more layer to the problem of self-identification and membership in the Western club. The USSR was a country driven by an ideology with ambitions to make it prevail globally. That is to say, as Halstead points out, the USSR, just like revolutionary France or the United States, was a state with a deeply ingrained sense of exceptionalism, which makes states' participation in international society inherently problematic. As Halstey points out the exceptionalist's modus operandi, freedom from external control, Halstey 384, that is, the view that no norms and rules of international society should constrain such states, as there are more significant missions for them to accomplish. Exceptionalism makes states claim the right to live according to different norms, which the USSR did during the Cold War. For details, see Halstey 2011, 390. This element of exceptionalism adds another layer of difference, further reinforcing the ambivalence of Russia's search for recognition. Ironically, such a sense of exceptionalism and mission does not make a state's identity more resilient and self-assured. On the contrary, 
It may make states particularly sensitive to other states' disrespect and attempts to challenge their goals. That is, such states also tend to see themselves as the victims of others, as Halsty pointed out in the case of the United States, underlying much of the need to have an external foe or enemies. Is the portrayal of the exceptionalist as a victim of others' hatreds and malign intentions? American innocence is a prominent theme throughout the historical discourse on American foreign policy. It is others who threaten American interests and values, and the United States itself is seldom the perpetrator of actions that give rise to foreign resistance. Halsty 2011, 395. These words arguably describe not only the United States but other countries as well. It is also instructive to understand Russia's quest for standing, which, if this argument is followed through, leads to a realization that states driven by exceptionalism are ultimately not seeking recognition as equals, but are seeking recognition of their superiority. That is to say, while an account of the Cold War as the USSR seeking Western recognition could be argued, it is at least equally plausible to posit that Russia was seeking prominence. As Ringma highlighted, the USSR was obsessed about a race with the United States in space exploration to the Olympic Games. They wanted to excel and by excelling come to be recognized as equal or superior to the Americans. Ringma 2002, 129. Yet despite all these efforts, the US's material superiority was obvious. What made the USSR its equal was its ideology, which was increasingly losing its charm, and its nuclear arsenal. But that was hardly enough for parity. The situation that Helmut Schmidt allegedly ironically captured by saying that the USSR was up of Ilta with nuclear weapons. Quoted in Adil Mike 2016, 54. However, from the Russian perspective what was perhaps lacking was fully compensated for by Russia acting as the guardian of the true values of Europe. The trope that recurred time and again over the past 200 years. During the 19th century, it was Russia that preserved the values of the Ancien regimes. During socialist times, Russia represented progressive socialist Europe, the path that the rest of the continent failed to follow Neumann 1996, 194, and during the Putin era, Russia is again the guardian of the true Europe by protecting Europe's Christian heritage at a time when the West has fallen into decline and decadence Neumann 2016, 1383. From this perspective not recognizing Russia is absurd, as Russia deserves only appreciation and acknowledgement, political cartoons and Russia's changing image. In this last section of the article, I will discuss cartoons about Russia Putin in two time periods, at the time of annexing Crimea and after the invasion of Ukraine. In his seminal work on images, Mitchell highlights that images do not have a straightforward meaning. The spectator needs to project voice into the Mitchell 2013, 140 which leaves room for a wide range of interpretations depending on the context and the spectator. Still, interpreting images is not completely arbitrary, as there are shared common reference points, symbols, and iconic signifiers that are shared by spectators of a common cultural background. I am not claiming, therefore, that the interpretations I am offering below are the only correct ones, or would be exhaustive. Nevertheless, I do believe they capture some of the major aspects through which these cartoons talk to the audience. The fact that makes the analysis of political cartoons probably easier than that of art is that political cartoons work by invoking commonly shared icons, representations, and stereotypes that ordinary observers are likely to be aware of. Russia as a fearful great power, Putin dominating the game, Russia's 2014 annexation of Crimea even though camouflaged as a referendum, led to Western criticism. As Gerard Erod, France's representative to the UN pointed out, the move would lead to Russia losing its standing and undermine its international prestige. Russia will gain Crimea and lose its credibility. What will happen to the credibility of Russian diplomacy when it tries to return to its foundations? Respect for the territorial integrity of states and non-interference in the internal affairs of states, a diplomacy that encouraged and recognized the secession in Georgia and annexed a region of Ukraine. It will be met with nothing but sarcasm and a shrug. Errol 2014, the occupation of Crimea triggered Western sanctions, and Russia was expelled from the G8. At the same time, this move, reminiscent of imperial times, made many reevaluate their view of Russia. 
Russia was seen as a power to be reckoned with and was once again referred to as a great power, a status that had not been attributed to Russia since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Roran, studying the United States' discourse on Russia before the annexation of Crimea, argues that Russia was depicted as a fallen power, in need of psychotherapy, being taken over by a post-imperial hangover. Roran 2023, 29, political cartoons following the annexation of Crimea show nothing of this. Putin returned in the images as a player dominating global politics. The three cartoons I will discuss briefly, all published in Western papers, show Putin triumphantly dominating the events. In the first by Morton Morland titled Ukraine Chess, Image 1, Putin is the strategic mastermind who outsmarts Western leaders and surprises them with a move that was beyond the rules of the game. In the second image, by Peter Brooks titled Putin Bags the West, Image 2, he is shown as a hunter who has shot all Western leaders, by which the cartoonist simultaneously underlines the incompetence of the West. Finally, the third image by Rick McKee titled Putin Bear shows Russia as having true power in the United States as hardly a match for it. Image 3. Rick McKee, in an interview, mentioned that he was inspired to make this image by the media that depicted Obama as weak and Putin as strong at the time. Kaggle Cast 2023. Image 1 Ukraine Chess, 2014, by Morton Moreland. Open in new tab download slide. Image 2 Putin Bags the West, 2014, by Peter Brooks. Open in new tab download slide. Image 3 Putin Bear, 2014, by Rick McKee. Open in new tab download slide. Symbols such as chess, the bear, and the sickle and hammer are all typical references to Russia but also refer to the Soviet Union, invoking Cold War times when the USSR was a superpower. The images show a confident Putin and puzzled, helpless Western leaders. The way the images are composed also reinforces Putin's dominance. In the first image, he alone occupies half of the room, sitting in a very relaxed manner. In the second, he is confidently in front of the others, while in the last, Putin and his bear occupy 80% of the image. In all the pictures, Putin is wearing a military uniform, he is commanding tanks, has a rifle, and his bear's hat suggests being affiliated with the military. The half-naked, muscular image of Putin shows power, while it also invokes photos of Putin taken and circulated to increase his popularity among Russian voters. The cartoons are making fun of this image, and offer a stark contrast between the military-obsessed Putin and Western leaders, wearing civilian clothes. This suggests that the latter are not relying on brute force in solving problems. In the first cartoon, they stand perplexed, or just contemplating, while watching Putin. In the second, they are helplessly hanging on the wall as hunting trophies. While in the third, Obama is shot and threatened. They are clueless about what to do facing such uncivilized behavior. The last image, in which Obama is frightened by the big bear, almost foreshadows the infamous meeting between Putin and Merkel, where Putin brought his huge Labrador, fully aware that Merkel was afraid of dogs. The images are packed with distortions. In the first, Putin plays chess with tanks on a board painted in the Ukrainian national colors. In the second, Putin is meeting heads of states not at a conference table, but as heads hanging on the wall, with distressed and angry looks on their faces, and in the last, Obama holds a toy bear in his hand. This is an unlikely item in the hand of the president, making him look weak, especially compared to the ridiculously muscular hyper-masculinized Putin. These distortions enhance the humorous effect with an element of surprise and a witty twist. While the annexation of Crimea undermined Russia's standing internationally, the cartoons emphasize Russia's strength. Even if Russia was criticized for not being a norm-conforming member of international society, the cartoons show Russia's dominance and depict Putin as a leader capable of rewriting the rules of international relations as he likes to have its desire fulfilled. While the annexation of Crimea triggered strong resentment in the West, as it was seen as a violation of basic constitutive principles, Russia was also seen by many as a power willing to stand up for what it wants and rely on force if necessary. Although fear confers a position in the realm of IR, where many see power as the ultimate arbiter, whether fear can lead to recognition is debatable. 
While ISA doubts fear can create genuine recognition ISA 2015, pages 41 to 2, Ringma suggests that one way for states to try to acquire the status they feel is their due is by bombing their way to respectability. Ringma 2012, 8. There is no universal answer to this question, but one way to approach this question is from the perspective of the receiving side, that is, whether the actor finds the image reflected in the mirror offered by others comforting or not. How do these images about a powerful actor to be feared resonate? Would these cartoons upset the Russian audience? While clearly there is no such thing as a Russian audience for many in Russia, the reflections these cartoons offered were probably not discomforting, on the contrary, they fit a desired image of Russia. The reason for this is that being feared is an image that many Russians associate with the image of a great power. A survey conducted among Russians found that most believed Russia should be feared if it is to be respected, while half of respondents also agreed with the statement that the president must be the all-powerful master of the land. And of 2006, 112, the image the cartoons convey resonates with this attitude to power and foreign policy, which, as Applebaum argues, also captures the essence of the ideology of Putinism. It is deliberately taught to Russian children, promulgated to the voting public and propagated in the media. It is the basis for Russian foreign policy, and it comes complete with an interpretation of the past and predictions for the future. It even has an ostensible goal. It proposes to make Russia strong and feared again. Applebaum 2013, 4. The understanding that Russia is only respected and recognized because it is feared is not new, but goes back centuries. During the 18th century, Russian Vice-Chancellor Peter Shafarov expressed a similar idea when he noted that Western powers were seeking Russia's alliance rather through fear and hate, than through feelings of friendship. Neumann 2008 A. 30. In this logic, being great and being feared are almost synonymous. Toll argues Putin was fully aware that the annexation of Crimea was going against norms of appropriateness, but for him, the violation of norms was not a problem. Quite the contrary, it was the confirmation of Russia's greatness, but breaking the rules seemed a privilege of great powers, an exception enjoyed by those powerful enough to be above the law in Russia, told 2017, 223, or a way for Russia to reveal itself as a great power again. Not playing by the rules has been part and parcel of the repertoire of Russian conduct, dating back to Soviet times. Its diplomatic practices offer numerous examples of Russia violating conventional forms of behavior, such as Khrushchev banging his shoe on the table in the UN which might be a myth but his shouting was confirmed. The first image in which Putin plays chess with tanks resonates with Russia, not playing by the conventional rules of chess, but making its own rules. The interpretation of such acts is not trivial though, and such acts can carry a double meaning. They could indicate the lack of decorum for an ignorance of rules of international conduct, but at the same time, they can also be seen as interventions through which to signal dissatisfaction with the way the game is played attesting to the fact that Russia is a power that has the freedom to violate rules freely Neumann and poorly at 2011, 132, violating ordinary means of conduct characterized not only Soviet times, but is also recurrent in modern-day Russia's foreign policy. In their article, Kirovska and Reshetnikov point out that Russia took upon itself the role of the trickster, one who is ridiculing the system and thereby suggesting that it stands above it, Kirovska and Reshetnikov 2021, discussing the Skripal tweets, 11 Copper similarly argues that these tweets conveyed a plurality of meanings that included the message that Russia was ready to use any means necessary, and was not constrained by customary norms of conduct, Copper 2021, full stop. Thus, the three cartoons depicting Russia violating the rules of the game, and triumphing in a sense resonated with Russia's self-description. At the same time, it is crucial to see that these cartoons show more. On the one hand, they depict a powerful Putin, representing Russia, who is the master of international political chess. At the same time, however, these images also offer the depiction of an incapable, impotent West. This is a West in decline that cannot take a stance against Russia, but is simply watching Russia's virtuosity in shock, or hanging on the wall as mounted animal heads. Such a West? Putin could have believed, 
would be displeased with the invasion of Ukraine and introduce a few sanctions. These would hurt. But as hypocritical as the West is, going along with the account of the West he continuously offered, it would soon accept the realities of the new status quo. It was unlikely that the West would take a united stance and help Ukraine. This view was reinforced by the West's relatively weak response to the occupation of Crimea, with its leaders seeking a peaceful solution when, as Kasparov suggested, there was already a war in progress, Kasparov 2015. Thus, Putin had reasons to miscalculate, especially because during the COVID years, the lack of personal meetings and interaction between leaders limited the ability to gauge the sentiments of others correctly. Cartoons certainly did not let Putin to make his reckless moves, but could help to reinforce an atmosphere by confirming an image of a Russia that was superior to the West. However, here we should emphasize that cartoons, as all images, can have a plurality of meanings. Any emphasis of what an image expresses can differ radically depending on how one is looking at the picture. While the images could be read as confirmations of Russia's power, the reflections these cartoons offer could also be read foremost as wake-up calls for Western leaders to pull themselves together, and to take a firm stance against Russia. From this perspective, the cartoons were saying such Russian behavior should not be tolerated in the future. If read this way, the cartoons that could reinforce Putin's belief that the West would remain passive could also encourage Western leaders to act decisively at the next occasion, and not be ridiculed again. Russian cartoons after the war, humiliation is not misrecognition. Years after it started, it is safe to say that the war against Ukraine was the outcome of miscalculation and hubris, and a dead end without an exit strategy. As Berezow put it, for Putin, for a man who was perceived for decades as playing a masterful game of geopolitical chess, this was an own goal of biblical proportions, Berezow 2022. We will never know what would have happened had Putin's original plans succeeded, whereby by the time the West woke up, a new government would have been installed in Kiev. The war against Ukraine should have been only a further, even bolder show of force to demonstrate that Russia was a great power, willing to violate rules to achieve its objectives. Criticism would have followed, but ultimately the world should have recognized the new realities, and Russia should have been recognized as a power to be feared and increasingly needed to be reckoned with. But things unfolded differently. This time, the West's reaction was firm and united, and the war was enormously counterproductive. Putin's image in the West shifted on the spur of a moment from that of a transgressive power, into one of miscalculation and impotence. Russia turned from an emerging great power into a sheer abnormality. Twelve no medium could convey this better than cartoons did. The second set of three cartoons was made by the same cartoonists as those in the previous section of the article. But even though the cartoonists are the same, the tone has changed radically. They ridicule Putin just as before. But whereas in the earlier cartoons, this ridicule was coupled with a demonstration of power and dominance, in these images ridicule is coupled with a depiction of Putin as pathetic and miserable. The cartoons depict Putin's fall in status from the position of being the master of the game to one who is weak and deplorable. In none of the images do we see the muscular, half-naked macho man. We see instead a pathetic figure. In the first caricature in this section, the absurdly huge table, image 4, which earlier had an intimidating flair, even though it was bizarre, is a source of ridicule. Cartoon by Morton Morland titled Vladimir Putin. Putin is hiding behind the chair, like a child who did something bad and has been caught by his parents. This can be read as a reference to the fact that the United States was warning the world that Russia was preparing to attack Ukraine, though Russia denied it. The shadowy image shows light only leaking into the room, alluding perhaps to Russia's lack of transparency. At the same time, the world had changed. The fact that Russia did not stop gave the clear message that no appeasement would work. There was no peaceful way to re-engage Russia. Simply put, there was no partner to recognize or to negotiate with. Russia's act was not to be tolerated, because this became a question not of border disputes, but basic principles of the international order. The image of the kid hiding behind the chair could suggest Putin, realizing that this time he had gone too far. The West was not as impotent as he thought. At the same time, the image can also be read from the perspective of Russian domestic politics, 
where Putin is a leader who does not trust his entourage and is left without critics, just like Stalin, who purged all opposition. Here, the empty room suggests that Putin is alone, and he might not be as in control as he is believed to be. Image for Vladimir Putin, 2023, by Morton Morland. Open in new tab download slide, in the second image by Peter Brooks, image 5, if we connect the evolutionary track to ideas of international society, where recognition is dependent on being regarded as civilized country, the image shows Russia's downfall, with even a monkey on its way to becoming a man looking puzzled at the naked and bloodstained Putin. The men of evolution are increasingly shocked and look at Putin with disgust. Putin is going in exactly the opposite direction than mankind, even going further back than where apes are coming from. The way Putin is holding the two rockets is also telling, as he grabs them the way a caveman would hold a club. The rockets are hardly threatening, suggesting that Putin's threats with nuclear weapons were only bluffs. At the same time, he is holding on to them as ultimately there is little else left for him to make the West reluctant to offer its full support to Ukraine. While the first set of cartoons only hinted at Putin being uncivilized, hear the message, especially with the evolutionary image is unmistakable. Image 5 Putin Ukraine 2022 by Peter Brooks. Open a new tab download slide. Finally, in the last caricature by Rick McKee Putin's Ukraine War Frankenstein, Image 6, a tiny Putin, who holds his hands and legs as a puppet, lacking any control over his fate, is eaten by a green monster called the Ukraine War, which has spiraled out of his control and consumes him. The monster alludes to the story of Frankenstein, where the creature Frankenstein brings to life ultimately turns against its creator. Similarly, Putin's plan to force changes upon international order, and to demonstrate the weakness and disarray of the West, only led to NATO becoming more united than before. 13. This unity may dwindle later, yet at the time of writing this article, it is stronger than ever before, exactly the opposite of what Putin probably wanted to achieve. The Frankenstein reference is especially revealing in contrast to the first three sets of images, where Putin was in control. The Frankenstein story is about this loss of control, hubris, and an undesired outcome. The choice of Frankenstein also allows for the creator to refer to the monstrosity of war, even in a humorous image. Image 6 Putin's Ukraine War Frankenstein, 2023, by Rick McKee. Open a new tab download slide. Looking at these three cartoons, there are also some common features. In all three cartoons, Putin is depicted in a childish way. In the first image, by hiding behind a chair, he is presented as a child fearing getting scolded for some mischief. In the second, he is childlike by crawling on all fours naked, like a baby. Finally, in the third picture, he is shown as a tiny puppet. Note here the contrast, in the previous set, Obama was childish with a toy bear. The childishness here, however, is not that of innocence and cuteness, but lack of maturity, revealing someone who has not learned how to behave properly, not being civilized enough to deserve recognition. Whereas in the first set of images, Western leaders were still present, even if in an inferior, perplexed position. In the second set, there are no other leaders anymore. Putin is alone, left with the creature of his making, suggesting that the split between Putin and the West is final. The general dark and shadowy tone of the background of all three images reinforces this visually. Looking at the images can help us realize something possibly crucial about recognition, but which has not been highlighted by the IR literature. Namely, these images are not simply critical. They do not simply suggest misrecognition, because they go far deeper than that. They are, in my view, outright humiliating. In discussing recognition and humiliation, Margulis argues that although there is a direct connection between the two, they are not two sides of the same coin. Humiliation cuts much deeper, and it has a much stronger psychological effect, which is more difficult to overcome, turning its occurrence into a formative experience of one's identity. It remains a scar that is easy to reopen. Every time it is torn up it is relived, making the original discomfort and shame return vividly. Margulat 2002, 112 and 130, as Soret points out, even when the humiliated actor later acts in a way suggesting having overcome the experience of embarrassment, 
Humiliation is difficult to overcome as it tends to remain a deep simmering resentment that lurks just beneath the surface. Soret 2006, 509. Thus, humiliation feeds ontological insecurities by making the actor sensitive to future offenses, with every new offense invoking the discomfort of the earlier humiliating experience. Actors frequently attempt to redress the situation and their standing through acts of counter-humiliation, but this rarely heals the permanent wound caused by humiliation. Soret 2006, 518.14. The fact that humiliation cuts so deep creates vexing dilemmas, such as how to reintegrate humiliated actors into the club later, in a way in which the humiliation is resolved, and the actor feels secure in its status without simply waiting for an opportunity to take revenge. The reintegration of defeated great powers into international society is not an easy matter. The Congress of Vienna was successful in reintegrating and recognizing France, but those were different times, and the reintegration of Japan and Germany into international society after World War II took place only after complete regime changes, and the creation of new states with new constitutional frameworks, and even there, despite the incredible success of both countries, a touch of resentment remains to this day, at least in Japan. Perhaps the fact that states differ from individuals could alleviate this task a bit, that is to say, one of the major reservations concerning the use of recognition in IR is that many doubt whether interactions and sentiments between humans are transferable to states. Ehrman 2013, 146, looking at the caricatures, they refer to Russia via the image of Putin, creating an identity between the two. Yet Russia is clearly not identical with Putin, thus, if the two could be dissociated from one another, which at this time does not seem easy, Humiliation could perhaps be attributed to Putin only, and Russia could regain its standing. Such a brief discussion of these brilliant cartoons could not aim at their comprehensive analysis. Instead, the objective was to offer an indicative reading of these cartoons that shows their richness in conveying misrecognition and rejection, adding an additional layer to the recognition game. Conclusion The end of the war in Ukraine is not in sight yet. How long the West will support Ukraine is unknown. Russia's objective is unclear to outsiders and perhaps also to Russia and its leaders. Although Ukraine's aspiration for NATO membership is referred to as one of the main reasons for the war, the words of Primakov at the time of NATO's earlier expansion suggest that the problem is foremost tied to status and recognition, and not security. Faced with Eastern European states joining NATO in the 90s, Primakov pointed out that the expansion of NATO is not a military problem, it is a psychological problem. Sihankov 2013, 106. The situation today is probably similar, and the war today is again just as much about Russia's status and recognition, as it is about questions of security. The aim of the article was to contribute to a better, more nuanced understanding of recognition by arguing that recognition has many layers and these layers may convey different messages at the same time. To illustrate this, the article focused on political cartoons of Putin after the annexation of Crimea. The cartoons offered a suitable reflection of how Putin was not in the game states play anymore. Still, Putin was depicted as a strong man with power that could invite the respect of some, like a mafia boss who enjoys being feared by intimidating others. Although on the level of formal states' relations, Russia was condemned, Political cartoons of the time depicted Putin as a master of international relations. While this image was not necessarily a comforting one, it arguably conformed to ideas prevalent in Russia holding that being feared was the quality that defined a great power, meaning that in a sense, these cartoons conferred a sort of recognition that Russia was craving. But if this argument is correct, the war against Ukraine from the perspective of Putin was not just another reckless move which was to invite international criticism, but would ultimately buttress Russia's standing as a transgressive power to be feared and reckoned with. It would reinforce Russia's image as a great power, a power that is not asking to be accepted into the club, but kicks the club's door in and takes its rightful seat among the club's board of directors. But events unfolded differently, and the war proved counterproductive. 15. The West committed itself to assisting Ukraine and firmly condemned Russia. The attitudes toward Russia changed radically. Cartoons created after the war reflected this change. The tone of caricatures changed. There was a rupture. 
cartoons, instead of showing a powerful Putin, depicted a miserable one. These cartoons not only neglected to confer recognition but were outright humiliating. As such they could be taken as a huge slap in the face, because, as the article highlighted, humiliation was not the opposite of recognition which is misrecognition, or lack of recognition. Humiliation cuts much deeper and creates wounds that are easy to reopen. When such wounds are later remembered they tend to be relived, with the feeling of humiliation and frustration returning, a topic that calls for further scrutiny. In his study of war and recognition, Lindemann argues that states with hubristic identities, that is, states that are trying to punch above their weight, tend to be extremely sensitive to offenses and take every opportunity to feel humiliated. Lindemann 2012, 214. Russia's now 300-year-long struggle for recognition offered plenty of opportunities for such a sensitivity to evolve, partly because of the West's neglect and partly because of Russia's sensitivity see Carlton 2022, on Russia's sense of being victimized, but also because Russia's quest to join the club has been tainted by the contradictory aspirations to be recognized as a member, while at the same time also be recognized as a unique and exceptional actor with privileges. 300 years is a long time, and it prompts the question of whether by now Russia internalized a victim identity stroke mentality to the extent that depriving it from this would lead to ontological insecurities. If yes, the situation is akin to what Mitzen describes as actors getting attached to a conflict, with conflict becoming ingrained in how identity is defined via a conflictual relationship Mitzen 2006. If this is the case, Recognizing Russia in a comforting way seems to be an extremely hard nut to crack. Using cartoons as illustrations in the article pointed out how cartoons could contribute to the recognition game. While their study from two different periods also offered the opportunity to capture how change of tone in cartoons reflects the mood, the shift in opinion and sentiment that Do's highlighted as one of the characteristics of cartoons, Do's 2001, 995. Further studies of cartoons can dig deeper into the question of how cartoons can express various tonalities of recognition, rejection, and even humiliation. Also, more rigorous analyses could scrutinize the changing tone of cartoons in any given time frame systematically by coding, sorting, and analyzing larger representative samples.